Hi, I'm Leisha in Bangalore, India. And I'm Steph in Toronto, Canada, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And you're listening to Trash Bags Podcast. It's Trash Bags Podcast. We're two trash bags and chatting. Hey, Steph. Hey, Leisha. <laughs> How's, it, How's going? it going? Ah! We're twins. <laughs> <laughs> It's going good. It's 10 at night. Weather's lovely. And I'm chilling here with you. What's better then, right? Aww. How's it going with you? That's very sweet. Um, I'm doing pretty good. It's oh, 1, 2, 3, 4 p.m. And it just stopped raining out. So I think that's some good luck. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, chat with also, you. Also, the right time to talk about rich people. Oh, we love them. We hate them. They're going to be around us or not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We have no so. choice, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So today we are getting into survival of the richest part two. We've covered this topic once before in season one. Um, but we wanted to dive in a little deeper because we had been having like a three hour long phone call with ourselves before deciding to hit record and we Mm -hmm. just thought we should go back and revisit some of those topics actually on the podcast so if you haven't heard episode one of survival of the richest we recommend you go back and check that out it's quite interesting we talk about the wealth disparity with the covid vaccinations and um, quite a bit of covid chat actually and how that sort of affected things um, yeah, we'll put a link in the description box for you to be able to find that easily. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Okay. There's Let's so get... much to talk about when it comes to rich people, <laughs> the wealth gap. So, you know, we couldn't cover all of that in one episode. And now we're getting into more details in this episode, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially um, last episode, we talked quite a bit about, like I said, rich people and COVID and how that sort of relates to things. Um, But I think this time we're getting a bit more into the rich people and the environment and sort of what what that looks like in rich environmentalism and blah 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 kind of things. Yeah, that's what we're getting into. Mm -hmm. (laughs) First of all, I think that it's the rich corporations that are ruining the earth. And then, you know, finding alternative environmentally friendly solutions are expensive because they're so nascent and it's, um, it's small scale. So, of course, it's going to be expensive for the consumer. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, uh, so the rich is literally propagating the destruction of the world on so many levels. Mm -hmm. As a consumer, we have no choice sometimes, but to, you know, give in to these big corporations, we cannot always support our local businesses sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, where am I going with this? (laughs) Well, I, I think even just like in in the products that we do purchase and when we are choosing like even if you're even if you're trying to be environmentally friendly and conscious like in the end the consumer isn't the one who made the product right so it's like the consumer can't at all be responsible for say how much I don't know if your laundry detergent comes in a plastic jug because that was the only way you could buy laundry detergent for years and years and years. Then they came up with the pod packets and now they have those like paper strip laundry detergent things that just come in like a cardboard sleeve. Like the consumer had literally zero power over buying laundry detergent in a jug that would create this plastic container that had to go into this fake recycling system for years. Is that sort of where you're mm-hmm. going? I don't know. Did yeah, I just hijack I your thought? To say that, <laughs> I think what I was trying to say is they are, they are, you know, 
uh, the way they work, they are ruining the earth. And then they make uh, uh, living a more sustainable life harder than ever because their products are cheaper. And then, you know, sustainable yeah. alternatives are so much more expensive. So it's like, like you they, they've sort of, um, you know, imprisoned us in a situation that we cannot really help ourselves to to live the way that we probably wish we could. Mm-hmm. What were we talking about the other day for three hours? Honestly, I don't remember anything. I mean, that was like months ago. But um, one of, I guess, two of the kind of big points that I remember us talking about and that I've written down for us so they don't run away like my previous thought. <laughs> um, were the rich comp- company's responsibility towards their workers and also like rich individuals being able mm-hmm. to afford these ego options. Mm-hmm. Um, which, oh, oh my gosh, that's the thought that sort of ran away because that's where you were headed with your thought process. And I was like, mm-hmm. ah, I wanted to comment on the thing Leisha said. Um, mm-hmm. Was how as consumers you can't always afford um, the eco options because they are they're more expensive. Typically, a lot of the times, you know, like you can buy a pack of 100 plastic disposable straws for $2.99 or you can buy one reusable straw for $5.99. And if in that moment you only have $2, $2.99, whatever, $3, um, you can only afford to buy the disposable straws. You know, of course, straws being just one example of any other item that could be potentially mm-hmm. on the market. And it's it's hard as a consumer when people always say like your money is the buying power, your money is mm-hmm. what informs these larger companies and you know changes their processes and it's like okay, but if, you know, say for example, someone with a disability needs to use a straw to drink mm-hmm. a beverage, just using that example again, um, and they can only afford the disposable straws, then they don't have the ability to buy the reusable option to say to the companies, this is what I would prefer to purchase. You know, mm-hmm. And again, that could be used for so many other examples, kind of just slot a product in place. And it's like the, there is, yes, a responsibility on the consumer to be aware of what they're purchasing, Mm-hmm. But that shouldn't, it shouldn't be so difficult for the consumer to look at you products and say, this is the actual eco-friendly option, you know, because there is, of course, greenwashing out there that makes it so difficult to tell, is it actually the eco-friendly option? And then on top of that, if you can't afford the eco-friendly option, like you don't have a way as a consumer of using your dollar as that buying power, of using your dollar to send that message because you just can't afford it. Yeah. 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 I can totally relate to that. And when you're poor, you're just thinking about, you know, getting by or um, surviving that brief period of time instead of, you know, how can, how does my purchasing uh, power affect the earth in the long run? You know, that's, Mm -hmm. that's not on your mind at all. Yeah, that's sort of a privilege of the rich is to have that that mental space to be like, okay, where does, what is my buying power speaking to in this moment as opposed to just like, I don't know, do I want a chicken sandwich or not? You know, can I afford a chicken sandwich or not? It's like, oh, do I have the wealth to be able to go to an all vegan restaurant and buy the vegan chicken sandwich which is actually going to be five dollars more expensive um but i can afford that and i'm consciously making that choice though it's Mm -hmm. through i mean even like you know rich and poor are kind of vague terms because to a degree they have to be used relatively to each other you know like Mm -hmm. i I've said in the last episode as well, like I do come from a place of relative uh, financial privilege 
you know, relative to who I'm talking to, right? I've met people my age with far less money than me and people my age with far more money than me. Mm-hmm. And so the way that we navigate the world can be quite different because I do have the privilege to think about where some of my buying power is going. But that's only mm-hmm. some of my buying power. There's other things that I'm like, that is outside my financial realm to consider what this buying power is. I just need mm-hmm. to buy this product because it's the one I can afford. Mm-hmm. And so it, it happens on a consumer level as well. I would say this like, you know, there's there's the rich companies, but there's also rich consumers. Mm-hmm. And each of each every level has a responsibility to play. So the rich consumers. Mm-hmm. What incentive do they have to live an environmentally or sustainable lifestyle? You know, um, because so many times they want to uh, buy a certain product to probably show to the society that, you know, they have that state status and that power. And again, the environmental aspect is completely out of the picture. Again, what am I getting at? I have no idea. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that, I think you're getting kind of at something there about like, I don't know, I guess I sort of connected in my mind to like this sort of idea. I mean, and again, this is just an example, but social media, right? People like to put their life on social media and sort of like a bragging platform to a degree to say Mm -hmm. how well things are this is how beautiful my life is and so there is kind of that advantage of like if you're living a more eco-friendly option and you want to be bragging about something on social media like brag about how eco-friendly you are because people will admire that Mm -hmm. in you you know like I think we're kind of moving to a world where people are like oh wow that's incredible. You were able to put solar panels on your house. Like that is a brag for sure. That is a brag Mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I couldn't afford to put solar panels on the space I'm living by no means. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. if my neighbor put them up, I'd be like, oh damn, look at you. You're doing well, but also, oh damn, look at you. You're helping the planet. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know? And like, of course they're not intentionally bragging by putting the social solar panels up on their roof. Like there's only <laughs> one place you can really put those on your house. Um, mm. But you know, there is, there is kind of that. And then like, there's just like the general like reason that we're eco-friendly is like you do it because you can and you should, you know, like you do it because yeah, you're aware you that the, that the planet is on fire and you should be helping. You know, so if you... See, if the rich had this in mind, then they would have never built the corporation that they have in the first place, which is probably very destructive. For example, like an oil company, maybe. Those people are moguls, right? Mm -hmm. They're extracting oil out of the earth, which is not a good thing. And... Of course, when you burn fossil fuel, it's creating CO2. So all that they are worried about is getting rich. When in fact, you say that, you know, if they could and they should, who is teaching these people? Because the government policies, they're all made to favor these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which, I mean, and then that's where they say that the consumer power comes in, but the companies need to first and foremost acknowledge what they're doing and what it's affecting and who it's affecting because really it's affecting everyone, you know, and it's affecting Mm -hmm. the people, it's affecting the animals, it's affecting the plant life, you know, like everything gets affected by this whole pyramid of, I don't know, negative consumption and, I don't know, like, bad practices I guess mm-hmm. though you had also um, mentioned something to me just in a little brief chat we had right before recording mm-hmm. which I kind of want to touch on 
I guess now, um, was because I was saying like the rich consumers sort of have that responsibility to, um, to be like using the more eco-friendly options and stuff. But you were saying that in India there, it's typically the poorer people who are using the more eco-friendly options. Mm -hmm. Did you want to sort of expand on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in India, um, if you're a poor person, first of all, they probably have no electricity. But I'm I'm talking about really poor. So let's talk mm. start with that. They probably have no elect electricity. They have no um, you know luxuries. So they're only worried about fulfilling their basic necessities. So which means that they will look for the cheapest options to fulfill them. So it could be like, you know, uh, it, like a tin roof, it, it, like, uh, you know, a, a little set up by the street, which turns mm -hmm. into a slum. Mm -hmm. And then somehow they find uh, some electricity and plumbing or but there is no plumbing. They go out into the open and defecate and... Uh, you know they they do whatever little daily wage labor work that they can find so in such a situation he's probably the most sustainable person right mm -hmm. because for so to, like what they say about sustainability is that you you don't consume at all or you know like mm -hmm. if, if you if you want to the most sustainable for example the most sustainable fashion is not wearing clothes at all that is that is what they say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so if you want to think of it as this way then then you know it's it's you're, you're more sustainable when you're not doing anything you're not consuming anything you're not using anything mm -hmm. so i guess that is why i would say that the poor are so much more sustainable in that way because they're not using anything and mm -hmm. and the next level so if you look at middle class there is so much um thought in our culture where we we typically don't uh, throw something of uh, value to us previously so easily into the trash for example my t-shirt so i probably first i when i first buy it it's so brand new and nice that i would wear it outside where people could see it and then once it starts wearing out maybe it fades a little i i would wear it at home and then when it's a little more worn out, then I would wear it to bed. And now when it's, mm -hmm. you know, in shreds with a bunch of holes, it's all stretched out. And <laughs> I give it to my mom. She uses mm -hmm. it as a dust cloth. Mm -hmm. Or whatever so other fully lives a find. full life. Such a whole life. And then only when that piece of cloth is dying, it's dead, it's done, it's a <laughs> zombie, is when it goes into the trash. So it's so built into our culture to value something to a, lo like a lot, you know. It could to get be the anything. most it's not out just of it. Clothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, uh, also, before, when I was younger, how our consumption pattern, I can explain to you. So, we used to buy new clothing specifically for maybe the the birthdays or um, we, we have some special festivals in, in uh, Hindu religion mm -hmm. where they, they encourage you to wear new clothes. So those were the, specifically mm -hmm. the only times when we actually bought new clothes. So because I have two older sisters, I get a lot of um, hand-me-downs. So yeah. literally... Uh, we had just the right amount of clothes in the closet growing up and then later as we were older and fast fashion picked up and there were like a bunch of sales and clothing became extremely cheap is when we started consuming more and more and more and more mm -hmm. so growing up in my culture we were taught very excellent things you know Mm -hmm. So I would say that is dying now a little. It's not so much in our blood anymore. Mm -hmm. And so many times, it's not just me, my dad, my mom, my sisters, everybody. We we feel so like 
we we feel i don't know what the word is but we we feel terrible inside when we have to throw a bag of chips in the trash or whatever you know? mm. we're like what is the point you know it's it's mm-hmm. very durable plastic that is used only once and it, yeah. why is trash the only destination that we can think of so that is the reason why so many times my dad saves these bags and then he uses them as you know like plant bags you know he 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 uh, uh, germinates seeds in them or whatever like we try and mm. think of as many ways to divert uh things into the trash as much as we can mm-hmm. um that is why you should never come to my house because we are we are hoarders <laughs> <laughs> we hoard so much but yeah that is that is the idea i would say that the reason why india is so much more sustainable is not just because we are a poorer country but it is also so deeply ingrained ingrained in our dna to um mm. value and respect things Yeah, so you really get like an appreciation for that product through its whole life. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah. That is the reason why uh, uh you know, US or the first world countries produce the most trash and then mm-hmm. we don't. Uh, but I yeah. guess it's changing now. It is increasing now. Honestly, mm-hmm. throughout my life I've noticed that we are producing more trash now because we wow. have no other option because it's more products are coming in more plastic and more mm-hmm. packaging like paper box and then inside it is another plastic bag and inside it is another you know like i don't know i guess the food industry is trying to hold good by making more packaging <laughs> like, yeah. yeah it's it's it's, it's wild <laughs> like yeah um definitely kind of a lot to sort of think on um and like you said like the, the industries that are picking up more of these bad habits and like mm-hmm. why is that coming into your country when you know really we should be adopting these practices of appreciating something's full lifestyle you know which we sort of get ever so slightly here in the west with like thrift culture and vintage clothing kind of making more of an upheaval mm-hmm. and like stuff like that um mm-hmm. but really there isn't this appreciation for the full life cycle of a product so much like what you've expressed here because you know you still have people going oh i know i just bought a phone but the latest models out so i'm going to throw away my phone and get mm-hmm. the new one mm-hmm. which is just absurd like if, mm-hmm. if you know if if it ain't broke don't fix it you know <laughs> um and if it is broke then fix it don't throw it out <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah absolutely i would blame apple for that honestly they're the ones who started the you know oh we we launching this new model this year you have to buy it you know like it's so shiny really and beautiful that? yeah and and they really started that even before um they even got into the iphone like they kind of started that back with Do you remember the iPod Nanos and like the iPod mm-hmm. shuffles and stuff? Like I remember they like would release it and they'd be like the iPod Nano, that's the new one and it come in like silver, white and black. Mm-hmm. And then like a year later they'd be like we're releasing the new Nano and it would be the exact same product but now it came in pink, blue and green. And people were like, "Well, fuck, why do I have a black iPod when I could have a pink one?" <laughs> Are you kidding? And mm-hmm. so then and I mean even then you get into like and yes I understand like for a reason people have cases on their phones for like durability and protection but like I've had the same case on my phone since I bought it. I bought mm-hmm. the phone and the guy said this case will be good. It'll protect your phone from dust and falls and blah blah blah. Works great. In the time I've had this phone, I'm sure some people have gone through 15 new cases because now they want a pink one. Now they want the flower one. Now they want the purple one. Like if it's already serving its purpose, just let it be. <laughs> you know? Like I can understand and appreciate the want for new accessories and new fun things and you know, but there I feel like there's just like some areas of life where it's like you don't need 
that new fun thing. You like what you have is fine and will work. Absolutely. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. And just like appreciate the product you have and use it as it is. Mm-hmm. You know, no one's looking down on you because you didn't get a new phone case this week. No one's looking down on you because you didn't, I don't know, buy a new shade of lipstick or get a new shirt. I don't know. I guess maybe some people feel like they are getting looked down on. Mm-hmm. There's also like that whole idea that was going around. I know for sure when I was in high school, this was a big thing was like the outfit repeater. Like you couldn't be an outfit repeater. So you always had to be really? consuming more. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. Was that in school? Oh, yeah. In school, I remember having a friend who was like, I really love this outfit, but I wore it last month, so I can't wear it again till next month. Are you kidding like, me? Girl, like, if you like the outfit, just wear it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, instead of supporting this big conglomerate. Mm-hmm. Um, but now we're now we're sort of getting into fast fashion and how that <laughs> industry changes so rapidly. Hard to keep up with that one. And we're um, gonna get into that the next episode, anyway. So, oh, definitely that yeah. that could be a deep dive for sure on its mm-hmm. own. Um, yeah. Um, I guess, but kind of going back to the points that I had started off with. Um, about how rich companies do have a responsibility to their workers. Um, And, you know, these are companies that have a ton of money. And, you know, we see the things being like, it's the seven big companies in the world are responsible for all of this um, pollution and all of these things. And then you also see that the people working for them are making minimum wage. They're not making livable wages. You know, even at Walmart, it's a huge corporation and their workers are making minimum wage, you know. I don't think anyone gets benefits working at Walmart. Like, why aren't those workers being treated fairly? Why aren't they being paid fairly when, you know, these huge companies are, they have the heads of these companies taking a massive paycheck giving no money out to try and help the environment, try to help other people in other countries, like trying to help any causes whatsoever. They're just taking these massive paychecks so that they can buy a yacht. Um, And meanwhile, their workers are suffering. Mm -hmm. And their workers are the ones who need, you know, these raises and these bonuses and these benefits and all the things that will help them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've worked in places where, you know, the priority of the rich customer was the ultimate thing. And then you would have to somehow, you know, fulfill it no matter what and how you just have to do it, even though you're like wasting a bunch of shit or whatever, you know, Um, that's like the the highest priority because they're the ones with the money um, Mm -hmm. and we need the business. Mm -hmm. It's oh, like we sort of propagate their behavior with this sort mm-hmm. of uh, positive affirmation. Yeah. Yeah, I had this, like, kind of really, it was, like, a pretty fucked up experience when I was working. Worked one winter as a door-to-door fundraiser. Mm-hmm. And so we're going around specifically working for charities, um, raising money for them, talking about, like, crises in the world and, like, what's going on and all these terrible things you know, trying to raise funds to help with different causes. And it was really weird thing where we would go into, you know, sort of like a middle class neighborhood and you'd go around fundraising and, you know, you'd sign up a couple different people and you'd have like a decently successful night. It was, you know, it was all right. It wasn't anything so amazing. It wasn't anything too horrible, but you kind of came out feeling all right you know you got, you got some money for charity mm-hmm. and then what was so weird and dramatic was we would go to these like really poor neighborhoods like really pretty not good neighborhoods we'd all go around and we'd tell the exact same stories and we'd be talking about the same charities and fundraising for the same causes and mm-hmm. we'd raise so much money 
You know, Mm -hmm. like we'd get so many people on board because we were talking to these people who could relate to the experiences of, Mm -hmm. you know, these other people were referring to or what have you. And then we'd go into these neighborhoods that had mansions. They were huge. Like once we went into an area where like almost every house had its own gate that you had to go through and like you had to walk down these massive driveways where you couldn't even see the house at the end of it. Like it was almost scary to approach them because you're mm-hmm. like, oh, this could be where I die. Like they're so big. Um, like I'd go missing and no one would know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we kind of get into this neighborhood like, wow, these people have money. Mm-hmm. And we fundraise again for the same charities talking about the same causes and not a single one of us would raise any money okay. because these rich people just, they didn't care. They couldn't relate to the cause. They couldn't relate to the people we were talking about. Mm-hmm. At one point, to just get even more dramatic, one of my coworkers, who I believe it was actually my supervisor, who went up to a house and, you know, he's talking, hi, I'm here with this charity And this is sort of the cause that we're like really specifically out for an initiative for. The time was for Yemen because they're having like a huge, huge crisis. Um, And, you know, he's like really, he's talking like he's a very passionate person and very passionate about helping these people with these causes and stuff. And the person at the door who he's speaking to goes, oh, yeah, I know all about that charity. And he's like, oh, great. Like, that's incredible that you already know who we are. Like, we'd love to get you on board. She's like, actually... It was like the board of directors or like the head or like someone who was like really high up in this charity. She's like, is downstairs in my basement right now playing music with my husband. And he's like, oh my God, like this lady has to, like she must already be signed up. She must already be helping this charity. Like I'm not going to get her signed up because she must already be supporting them. So he goes to start talking to her like, oh, so like how long have you been supporting this charity for? (laughs) How much are you giving? Like we love to have your support, blah, blah. And she's like, oh, no, I'm not. I'm not like supporting them right now. It's like, oh, but like you're friends with the person who runs this charity. Like, and I can see the house that you're living in is enormous. And the way you're talking You know, I really get the vibe that you kind of have the money that you could be supporting this charity. Like, we're coming around asking for $5 a month, and you're living in a mansion with a gate at the front, and you're friends with the person who runs this charity, and you're still not willing to help out? Like, (laughs) do I need to take one of these starving children and bring them around with me? Like, (laughs) Like, what am I supposed to do? Start assaulting you with videos of people, like, literally being attacked? Like, what? On earth, how can you not open your eyes and sympathize and empathize with these causes, you know, and mm-hmm. sort of try to relate to the experience of your fellow man? And it, like, it was just, it was so boggling to me and like really eye opening to like, you know, this state of the rich and the poor and everyone in between and sort of, I don't know, it's just, it's really fucked up. <laughs> Yeah, that's a very hard story to take in, honestly. Mm-hmm. I can't believe that that actually happened to you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a big day for all of us leaving leaving the fundraising, you know, turf that day, and mm-hmm. we all sort of just walked off like, wow, you know, it's 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 hard when you sort of realize that a lot of the rich people they sort of take donating to causes and helping others as um, like sometimes you'd have to pitch it as like, Hey, tax season's coming up. (laughs) This is a great way to get your charity refund. So Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to support these starving children and get them this vital nutrients or, (laughs) you know, help them get vaccinated or help these journalists who've been trapped in prison like whatever particular cause we were talking about at that time Mm -hmm. and you know it's just it's so wild that like how can you be able to or not to relate to someone just because of the amount of ones and zeros in your bank account Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. which I guess because 
from a perspective that I, I can only see and kind of make up for myself is the sense of community. Mm-hmm. You know, you see in these poor areas and less privileged areas and, you know, even countries is um, that the less money, the stronger the sense of community that there is. Mm-hmm. Um, because people have to help each other out you know it's hey I I can't necessarily get lunch today can you cover my lunch today and I'll get you breakfast next week or Mm -hmm. you know what have you or Mm -hmm. I can buy you I can give you this shirt from my shop if you can cover my coffee today you know like Mm -hmm. whatever it is is hey I'm I made extra food let's all get together and have a big family style dinner and it's this more openness to having a sense of community and to building those relationships around you because you understand that those are the people you're going to need to but also want to rely on those are the people you're gonna want to go back to whereas Mm -hmm. when you have the money you have that sense of security of like oh no one can watch my kid that's fine I'll hire a babysitter I'll put them in daycare instead of just you know going to your neighbor's house and saying hey I'm running out for two hours on errands. Can you watch my kid? Because I trust you and I know you and you're a familiar face. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I don't know. That was kind of a couple different tangents that I went on to, but just some some experiences I wanted to share on the topic of the rich. Absolutely. I mean, We've seen some shit and we wanted to share it with people, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, would you say that you've noticed much of a sense of community in spaces that you've lived or been or like you're saying about these like poorer slum areas in India? Um, like is that something yeah, that holds absolutely. true? Absolutely. I mean... Uh, I can give you an example of that. We have a lot of um, street vendors. Mm -hmm. So they just set up shop in a busy street on the footpath. Literally no place for pedestrians to walk. (laughs) They're all over it. But um, lots of people go to them and support them. Because they know they're poor and, you know, they need the money. And they're sometimes cheaper than the stores. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a strong sense of community among them. Mm-hmm. You know, if if something goes wrong, like if the police is um, after them or something, they uh, definitely have each other's backs. But I totally get it, you know. I, I've lived a life of of luxury i've lived a life of absolute poverty (laughs) and it's just it's two completely different mindsets when you're when you're when you have food on your plate and you don't have to worry about it honestly you what was i trying to say that um you kind of don't really think about what you don't have you you sometimes don't um, think about somebody who is not privileged enough. You know, you're, you're, mm-hmm. I think it's because everybody is so up in their head only about themselves. Mm-hmm. It's so hard for somebody to think outside themselves. Yeah. Because so many times you don't see it. Like you said with the earlier example, do you have to bring a homeless child who is malnourished in front of this lady to make her understand the reality of the situation right we see Mm -hmm. so much news we see so much we get a lot of information but then it's too hard for us to actually sit and apply everything to it it's a very human thing i'm not making excuses in this Mm -hmm. case but when you're poor you're living in it you're living so you're it. relating to it directly every day. Absolutely. And you're expecting somebody else to come and save you, but nobody is going to do that. Mm-hmm. So it's a very tricky situation to kind of, you know, expect the rich to do any better, honestly. Yeah. I guess they will continue to behave the way they are. And and there is there's so much support for them to do that as well, right? Mm-hmm. So... 
honestly we can just have a discussion about it but nothing is ever gonna get fixed yeah it's like which i think was like sort of i guess like almost something we had kind of touched on is last time that we talked about this with like the idea of COVID kind of being this like potential equalizer and us realizing that like you know this is a virus it's outside of all of us and um, it will kind of do whatever it wants without our control and we'll see how people come out on the other end and of course the rich the rich came out on top they found a way to as they always will but it's like they like people need to be in those equalizing situations you know someone rich needs to be thrust you know not saying you need to get all your wealth taken away from you but go on a trip and only give yourself a certain amount of money to spend or don't even go on a trip give yourself a budget restrict yourself to a budget and see what it's like to try and live like that um because that's how you'll understand and can relate to the experience of someone who does have to live like that you know Mm. like I sort of get some of my experience from this from like working in theaters where I've been the one in charge of the budget and I have no money and I'm like okay we're gonna find a way to be frugal we're gonna find a way to remix and reuse our same pieces that we have because we don't have money to make this work Mm -hmm. you know and it gives you those perspectives and you know, living amongst and befriending people who are in different situations from you so that you can relate to their experiences on a much more human level. Because, you know, like watching a YouTube video where Angelina Jolie goes and does her volunteerism in Africa, it's like, oh, that's nice. She's helping some people. But you're not relating to those experiences firsthand. When I was a fundraiser and one of my coworkers told me that she grew up in Congo and her family was running away and had to go to the refugee camps and was telling us how she lived these exact experiences of these kids were fundraising for let me tell you I was very impacted by that and I was much more passionate a fundraiser mm-hmm. because I was like oh shit here's a real person who has lived this real experience like these things that people talk about and go through when you see it in books and movies it's so easy to be like that's a fantasy world that's like harry potter but no it's not Mm -hmm. these are people's real lived experiences and if you meet people who go through these things and you know if you open up your community that you have built around you Mm -hmm. then you're just going to be a much more compassionate person to the experiences of others around you Mm -hmm. Ah, that's well said and such a beautiful um, wrap up to this conversation I mean like I said what can we do we just have to live with it until we find better ideas we didn't talk only on the environment (laughs) talked about some other stuff too but I think that's Mm -hmm. good (laughs) <laughs> Maybe we can do a part three now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let us know if you want to hear part three to this conversation. Mm-hmm. As we said, these are only hour-long snippets from much bigger conversations we've had and mm-hmm. continue to have. A lot of mm-hmm. what we talk about, we continue to talk about afterwards or have talked about before or we want to talk to you guys about. So let us know for sure if you want to hear more on this or any of the other topics. Thanks for listening and join us next week for another episode. Please show us some love on Instagram at Trash Bags Pod. And remember, don't be a trash bag. Be a reusable bag. Also, thanks to our sound editor, Mika. This would all be so much worse without you.